Great. So I believe everyone is in. So welcome. Um, welcome to our University of Michigan workshop, Making Tosca Work, Demystifying the Risk Assessment Process. My name is Trish Komen, and I'm an assistant research scientist at the University of Michigan School of Public Health in the Environmental Health Sciences Department. Every year, we organize a public health practice workshop. And last year, our program focused on uh, the fifth year anniversary of the Toxic Substance Control Act amendments. Uh, so be sure to check out our Detroit Public Television program from last year as a free recording if you want to learn more about the basics of the law and how families in Michigan are affected. Today's workshop is sponsored by the Michigan Life Stage Environmental Exposures and Disease Center at the University of Michigan that's funded by the National Institute of Health, NIEHS. And I am delighted to have a wonderful program for you today with knowledgeable speakers to help us better understand chemical risk assessment process uh, so that you can better participate in the implementation of a relatively new, uh, newly amended law, TSCA, and its authorities for gathering data uh, and protections for people on the job and their families from occupational and community exposures to harmful chemicals. According to OSHA, workers suffer from over 1,000, excuse me, 190,000 illnesses and 50,000 deaths each year related to chemical exposures. And these are a preventable source of occupational disease. So we want to learn more about this. And so I wanna provide a very warm welcome today to our registrants from over 20 states and uh, tribes, a number of international participants as well and a special welcome to our occupational health professionals. And I hope that you will use the Q&A feature um, on your screen at the bottom to provide questions to our speakers at any time during the presentation. Um, and our next slide, I want to thank our sponsors. We've had a lot of wonderful partnerships with a variety of uh, programs, um, including the University of California, San Francisco Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment, and the UCSF Earth Center, which is also an NIHS funded center. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, the Environmental Health Sciences Department at U of M, and then many other associations, including the Association of Occupational Health Professionals and Healthcare, the Alliance of Nurses for a Healthy Environment, the American Association of Occupational Health Nurses, and the U of M Center for Occupational Health and Safety Engineering, as well as the HRSA-funded U of M Region 5 Public Health Training Center and several of our student organizations. So thank you so much for our sponsors and helping us to spread the word about our program today. We are also offering continuing education credits. Uh, so you can see our website that's here on the slide for details about how to uh, request these credits. And also our speakers um, do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. I, however, need to disclose that I have an outside interest. I will be joining the US Environmental Protection Agency as the Environmental Justice Coordinator and Scientist for the Office of Air and Radiation very soon. It's a little hard to say that even though I practiced it um, after 10 years at Michigan. So on our next slide, I would like to uh, show you our three-part program. First, we'll have welcoming remarks from Regina Strong to set the stage. Second, we'll uh, have uh, case studies to illustrate key risk assessment concepts, including Wendy Heiger Bernays, Graylin Nielsen, and Gary Ginsburg. And then we'll have a question and answer session led by Shanice Forte um, and with Wilma Subra, which will be um, introducing those speakers shortly. Um, so I wanted to just uh, provide a small story before we begin. So when we think about risk assessment, a story comes to mind for me. So around the holidays, my husband and I uh, were preparing a special holiday roast, you know, our great dinner. And I had a recipe card, you know, one of those well-loved cards that has personal handwriting and maybe some food stains on it because it's been used year after year. And the first step called for trimming off the end of the roast. And my husband said to me, why are we doing that? Why are we throwing away perfectly good food? And I thought about it and I said, well, you know, that's the first step on the recipe. And this came from my, my mom and we've always done it that way. So we asked my mom, well, why, why do we do that? And she thought about it and said, well, you know, that's what the recipe calls for. And that came from my mom. And that's the way we've always done it. 
And so we called my grandmother and we asked her, well, why is the first step to cut off the end of the rose? And she said, you know, honey, I had such a small oven and such a small pan that the only way it would fit is if we cut it off so it would fit. And, and so cutting off the end of the roast and, and removing that was only the only way that she could make it work. And we'd forgotten the reason for that. So the idea with the story is part of the motivation for today's program is we wanna question our assumptions. We wanna ask, why is it that we're doing it this way? Because doing it this way, because that's the way we've always done it, isn't a good enough answer as the science advances. And we want to really question our assumptions and the risk assessment process. And we don't want to be throwing away perfectly good data in our process. So it's my pleasure to introduce someone who often questions the assumptions to better advocate for health. And that is Regina Strong. So Regina leads the Office of Environmental Justice uh, and Public Advocate for the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy or EGLE. And for more than 30 years, she has been a leader in public affairs and advocacy. And before joining the state, she served as the director of the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign and was a senior fellow in the Great Lakes region for the Environmental Leadership Program. We're so delighted to have Regina here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trish. That was a great introduction and a great story, by the way, because it really is all about not doing things because we've always done them a certain way, but really looking at how we can do things to have impact and really change people's lives. And so I appreciate the invitation to do the introduction and kind of the welcome here, because I think it really is a great opportunity. And I want to congratulate you, by the way, um, Trish, for your, your new role. I'm really excited about that because it takes all of us with varied experience and understanding of both the science behind what we're trying to do to help impact the communities, as well as just the will to do it, to be part of this. So, you know, welcome to the team of folks fighting for environmental justice on the government level. My role as environmental justice public advocate is a new role that was created for the state of Michigan when Governor Whitmer took office. And what I quickly learned in that process is that exactly what you said, many things happen because of tradition, not necessarily because there is a, a real reason for it to happen that way. Of course, there are laws and there are regulations that must be followed. But, you know, I, I was just having this conversation earlier about the regulatory mindset, which is really very focused on um, science and technology from a very black and white perspective. It's in or it's out, it's right or it's wrong, it's the way we do things. And so much of my role since I've been in this role and so much of environmental justice is really looking at impact. And so I think it's interesting to talk about, you know, in the context of risk assessment, what that really means, right? So from the standpoint of impact, you have to first look at it from an equitable standpoint. And when you look at equity, you're really looking at what's needed versus what's already there. So, you know, many of you may have heard the whole concept of equality versus equity. And in terms of that, um, equality is really about giving everybody the same thing. Equity is really about giving people what they need. And, in, and when you talk about both occupational justice, when you talk about workers, or if you talk about environmental justice, you really have to think of where people are starting and go to where they are. So if you live in a community that's already burdened with other types of pollution or has other kind of impacts or is socioeconomically disadvantaged or has had challenges in other ways, you are not gonna start assessing them at that same point that you would other communities. So really, I think this is a great conversation to look at how the changes and potential changes to come can really give us a better expectation, um, a better look at how we address what communities face. It is very important, I think, when we talk about justice to think about the equitable part of it as well as the meaningful engagement part of it, understanding, you know, what are the health risks? What are the other risks that you're particularly vulnerable for if you've already been through 
um, or already experiencing certain things. So I think we have a real opportunity in this conversation and beyond to work toward really looking at disparate impacts. You know, some communities historically have um, been burdened by a lot of things. And so when you look at that impact and you look at the health um, assessment of those impacts, you really have to think about that. And, and it is kind of a new way for a lot of folks to think when you think about traditional ways of thinking, because you're more thinking about what are the potential risks, but you also have to think of who would experience those risks. So what factors are they already facing, who they are by a demographic perspective, you know, race, ethnicity, age, all of those things you have to take a look at. And so I'm excited to kind of welcome you to this conversation, to have the opportunity to listen with you and to work together to figure out what comes next. Because I think we're at the exciting edge of an opportunity to address um, some of these disparate impacts that have gone on for decades. And so I wanna hand things back over to Trish, um, but I wanna thank you all for participating today and being part of our conversation. Wonderful, thank you so much. This is really very inspiring. You know, when I think about when I started my career, it was early when the Clean Air Act was just amended in the 1990s and TSCA has just been amended. And so I think for many of our students, this is a really exciting time to learn about these topics and to, to get involved in a way that you can really make a difference. So important to, to be involved, to be working um, upstream at the systems level, to have that primary prevention to promote health. So I think that um, it's really important that we consider some of the details of uh, how TSCA is implemented uh, so that we can achieve those really important um, occupational and environmental justice goals. Uh, however, the risk assessment process can be very confusing. Um, and so part of what we wanna do today is to really um, try to demystify um, that process. And we've got a set of extremely uh, talented experts to help us explain some of these key concepts. And that will help us to fully utilize the um, data that we have in the risk assessment process. So I want to introduce three of our speakers um, who've worked together as part of the um, University of California, San Francisco pre-process um, in September of 2020 to develop some consensus statements, a set of five manuscripts that are currently under review um, called Setting a Health Protective Scientific Agenda for Chemical Policy. And so they'll be talking um, today and, and Meredith, feel free to bring the slides forward, um, Setting a Health Protective Scientific Agenda for Chemical Policy, um, Risk Assessment Concepts to Reflect Population Responses. So I wanna first introduce uh, Wendy Heiger Bernays. She is a clinical professor in the Department of Environmental Health at Boston University School of Public Health, where she applies her training in molecular toxicology to practical questions about the impact of industrial chemicals, consumer products, and pharmaceuticals in water and waste streams on people's health. Uh, she currently serves as a member of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Waste Site Advisory Committee and the Scientific Advisory Board for the Toxics Use Reduction Institute. She is chair of her local board of health as well. Uh, she was a AAAS Science and Technology Fellow, uh, hosted in the Office of Science Coordination and Policy at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and she worked on endocrine disrupting screening program chemicals. She also serves as the president of the International Society for Children's Health and the Environment, so welcome. Uh, the second speaker that we'll be hearing from is Graylin Nielsen. Uh, Graylin Nielsen is a doctoral student in the same department, the Department of Environmental Health at Boston University School of Public Health. She is the first author of the paper being discussed, and she is interested in applying a data-driven risk assessment method to quantifying population health associated with exposure to non-cancer causing agents. She earned her master's in public health uh, in environmental health and has used her training in uh, the field throughout the pandemic as a volunteer with the Cambridge Department of Public Health. Our third speaker is Gary Ginsberg. Uh, Dr. Ginsberg directs the New York State um, Health, excuse me, Department of Health Center for Environment and Health, 
a center which administers and coordinates water supply and food protection, contaminated site investigations, environmental epidemiological investigations, toxic substance risk assessments, and occupational health and injury prevention across New York State. He has served on a number of national committees, including US EPA's Science Advisory Board, US EPA's Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee, and a variety of National Academy of Science panels. Dr. Ginsburg is also on the faculty of Yale University School of Public Health. So welcome, and I would like to pass this over uh, to Dr. Heiger Bernays to begin the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trish uh, and others uh, for inviting us here today to present some of our work. Um, and today we're illustrating some key concepts in risk assessment and specifically applications of methods to address variability and uncertainty in estimating risks for non-cancer health effects. Next slide, please. So our roadmap for today is uh, shown here. I'm going to present some of the very basics of risk assessment, its practices, and some of the limitations that I will highlight, which will then allow us to step into uh, some of the uh, alternative or probabilistic risk assessment approaches, which will bring us closer to meeting some of the gaps that have already been identified by Trish uh, and others. And then we'll head to our case study um, where we will be looking at neurocognitive impairment associated uh, with, a, a, with a perchlorethylene exposure. Next slide, please. So several US and global authorities use risk assessment to regulate chemicals. The key users in the US system are listed here, including US EPA, NIOSH, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, Consumer Product Safety Commission. And this is actually used in other, other places as well. Next slide, please. But today we're focused on the EPA, and EPA uses risk assessment for informing decisions about use and restrictions uh, for pesticides, uh, agents in drinking water, um, other waters the, under the Clean Water Act, in air, uh, in hazardous waste, and today we'll focus on commercial chemicals um, as per the Toxic Substances Control Act. Next slide, please. So this is a photo of the signing into law, the long awaited Toxic Substances Control Act Amendment, uh, na namely uh, the um, Frank Lautenberg chemical safety for the 21st century. Next slide, please. Tosca relies on risk assessment. In fact, EPA is required to conduct risk evaluations for chemicals in commerce and those assessments must consider risk for vulnerable populations. Those are people who have higher or more frequent exposures to these chemicals. Thus, this provides EPA the opportunity to revisit and use recommendations that have been made over the years to provide evidence-based risk evaluations that can put context, could put risk into context for decision makers. Next slide, please. So what is a risk assessment? It is simply a tool. A risk assessment is a tool that allows us to combine data and information about exposures to chemicals with data about the toxicity or, or the hazardous nature of the chemicals in order to estimate health risk. And risk assessments have been done since the early eight, 1980s, and the way they are done hasn't really changed or evolved. Uh, it's like cutting off the ends of the, the roast before you put it into the oven. Even though we now have good data to show that some people are exposed to chemicals more or less than other people, and we know that some people are more susceptible to the effects of the chemicals than other people. And one, of, one very interesting thing about the way we conduct risk health risk assessments uh, for chemicals are that chemicals that have carcinogenic effects uh, are evaluated differently than the health risk assessments that are done for the non-carcinogenic effects of chemicals. Next slide, please. And these were some of the very issues uh, that were identified by the National Academy of Sciences in their, uh, in their 
recommendations to improve risk assessment. And that was to ex be explicit, explicitly consider, consider communication of uncertainty and variability and to harmonize approaches to cancer and non-cancer risk assessment and including cumulative risk uh, and employing new methods as well. So lots was pointed out in 2009. Next slide, please. So going back to the risk assessment process, it is really a systematic approach to organizing and analyzing scientific knowledge and information um, for hazardous chemicals or for substances that might cause risk under specified conditions. There are four steps to the risk assessment, and these are integrated, but the hazard assessment, the top part of the figure shows this is where chemicals effects on organisms and behavior in the environment is described. To the right in yellow is the exposure assessment. And this is where estimates are made uh, and describe how people are exposed, who is exposed, under what conditions, how frequently, and for how long in order to actually estimate a daily dose of exposure to a particular chemical. Left side, which is the blue box, is what we're gonna focus on today, is where estimates of toxicity are estimate, these estimates of toxicity per unit of chemical are actually derived. And then the fourth box on the bottom integrates the dose response assessment and the exposure assessment in order to provide estimates of health risk. So going back to the blue box, which is the dose response assessment, this is where we are going to focus the rest of this uh, conversation, which is on um, estimating these, what we call toxicity values. Next slide, please. So, do, so toxicity values are given to chemicals for their non-carcinogenic effects and for carcinogens. Specifically, we're talking about two uh, sort of flavors of toxicity values, namely the reference dose, which is an estimate of a daily oral exposure to the human population that is likely to be without an appreciable risk of deleterious effects during a lifetime. And its partner, the RFC, which Gary will talk about uh, later. Next slide, please. So this is a this slide is a dose response, shows a dose response curve. And uh, on the vertical axis, we show the risk, perhaps the risk of cancer. And on the horizontal, as a horizontal axis, you see the dose. And most importantly, the important point to take away from this curve is that there is a line that goes down from the curve into zero, into the, um, the very bottom of, of the dose response curve. And that tells us that at every dose, no matter how low, there is a finite risk or an estimated finite risk of cancer. This is not the case with non-cancer risk assessment where we do not estimate these risks at very low doses. Next slide, please. This is a dose response curve for uh, um, non-cancer effects of chemicals. And this is where we're going to derive that dose, that reference dose that I described earlier. The left axis, again, shows the response and the horizontal axis, the bottom axis is the dose. Note that at some dose, in this case, it's slightly higher than this thing designated as the NOAEL, which is the no observed adverse effect level there is no measured response. So below the NOEL, we don't see a response. That is That NOEL is called the threshold. And this is what we work with to develop the reference dose. Next slide, please. So this slide shows you a slightly more complex illustration of the previous slide. It is still a dose response curve. Uh, and what we see here is in the middle of the slide, we see well, the, the horizontal axis is the response, the, excuse me, the vertical axis is the response, the horizontal axis is the dose. We see the NOEL again, just to 
orient you and the low L, which is the lowest observed effect level. And then we see some other doses that are estimated using a more sophisticated statistical model to try and incorporate more of the existing data. But still we don't go down into that very low, very low dose range. So the important takeaway from this slide is that we are estimating what we call points of departure, right? And the points of the departure is the dose response point that remarks the beginning of a low dose extrapolation. This, and next slide, please. So then what do we do with that point of departure? Well, we take the point of departure and to that dose, there are a series of uncertainty factors or UF as designated in this slide that get used. These generally are factors of one, three, or 10, and they address common uncertainties that derive from using animal or less than lifetime exposure conditions. You see here the reference dose then equals that point of departure divided by a series of what we call default uncertainty factors. Next slide. So placing uh, us here again is to remind us that we are deriving that reference dose uh, as doses to which people can be exposed every day and not expect to see a deleterious effect. But remember, the reference dose is based on that point of departure that does not allow predictions at doses below that point of departure. Next slide, please. So this slide summarizes the how the RFD or RFC is derived for each chemical. You can find those RFDs or RFCs on the EPA website, the website that is called the Integrated Risk Information System or IRIS. And in the risk assessment, it is this reference dose that is compared directly compared to the dose that was estimated in the exposure assessment. The risk is not a probability of getting or experiencing illness or an adverse effect, but it's a quotient. If the ratio of the exposure to the reference dose or RFC is one or lower, it is assumed that the risk is de minimis. If it's greater than one, there is no prediction of adverse health outcome, but simply a need to look more closely and perhaps lower that exposure. So next slide, please. And I'm going to turn this over to Graylin. Great, thank you so much for laying the groundwork, Wendy. And I'm gonna pick up where Wendy left off to talk about some of the limitations that we have in the current approach to driving reference values and how we can do a little bit better to make sure that we are really fully utilizing the data that we have in our dose response assessments and our assessments of risk associated with chemical exposures. So as Wendy just alluded to, the output of a traditional dose response assessment is that single value. And we say above that, there is some risk of a health effect. And below that, there is a de minimis risk of a health effect. But there is no meaningful quantification of what that risk is across the full range of doses that humans may be exposed to. And de defining the, the um, reference values this way has some really important limitations. So first, current approaches do not distinguish between the variability in response and uncertainty in the reference value estimates. They also don't specify the population level risk of developing the health effects either at the reference value or around it, either below or above or below that value. So there is essentially no quantification of the health risk at those exposure levels. This has important implications, including that non-cancer health effects are frequently not incorporated into cost-benefit analyses, which means that we are missing some very meaningful opportunities to weigh the importance of pollution remediation. And the current approaches to driving reference values are inadequate to fully capture and understand population health risks and protect public health. Most importantly, we do have data and methods that allow us to fill these gaps. They are just not frequently implemented. And we can go on to the next slide, please. So there are statistical approaches to conducting risk assessments that have been proposed to address the limitations that I just described in traditional methods. Um, and these probabilistic risk assessments, as they're known, are simply methods that let you incorporate uncertainty and variability into risk assessments using various statistical approaches. When we talked about variability and what um, 
you know, when we're talking about variability, what we're really getting at is that humans are different, especially in regards to physiology. So this is why different dosing regimens, um, for example, for ibuprofen are recommended for adults and children. That's just one example of how human populations are not homogeneous. And probabilistic risk assessments really seek to leverage the data we have to replace those fixed uncertainty factors that Wendy described, um, because we know that one single value can't really capture all of the variability across human populations or between animal physiology and human physiology. So probabilistic approaches allow users to distinguish between variability and uncertainty, define the magnitude of the non-cancer health effect under consideration, quantify the proportion of the population expected to experience the health effect at a given exposure level, and then ultimately rede redefine those reference values, um, the toxicity values, uh, including the reference concentration and reference dose as risk-specific doses. The overall goal be here being to provide a more thorough quantification of risk across the exposure spectrum. And I'm gonna take you through the conceptual basis for some of these different statistical approaches um, that have been put forth and including the ones that we used in our case study where we apply these approaches to understand the effects of PCE on neurocognitive outcomes. And PCE is perchloroethylene. We can move on to the next slide. Um, there are three broad methods that we identified that leverage data to conduct probabilistic risk assessments. The three approaches and their definitions are listed here, and I will be walking you through the conceptual basis for these distributional approaches, um, including the background clinical vulnerability approach, con continuous risk functions, and then a distributional approach. And with each one, I'm going to try and show you how the approach does a better job of incorporating variability into risk assessments than our current methods. So on the next slide, we have the distributional approach to probabilistic risk assessment. And this approach really looks and feels a lot like the traditional approach, but it does incorporate more empirical data. So instead of using a single value of one, three, or 10 as an uncertainty factor, this approach is leveraging empirical data um, for each of those uncertainty factors. So for example, instead of applying a single value of 10 to represent all of the variability in human populations, this approach uses data from clinical trials showing variability in pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic parameters following treatment with different drugs in these trials. Another example is the adjustment for subchronic to chronic dosing regimens, where we're attempting to ensure that a reference value is protective of a chronic exposure scenario for human populations. So instead of using a single fixed value to represent that adjustment, actual data comparing subchronic no adverse effect levels to chronic no adverse effect levels for a range of different health effects are leveraged to really understand the variability and how dosing timing may impact the health effects associated with that exposure. These distributions are combined using mathematical approaches that I promise you I won't go into. Um, and the resulting distribution is applied to a point of departure similarly to how we do the traditional reference dose derivation. The next slide here is just going to um, illustrate what that looks like conceptually. So again, a traditional approach would provide a single value where we assume that there is some risk of the health effect above the value and a minimal risk below the value. But with a distributional approach, for any given dose, you can identify the population level incidence of that specified health effect and the total uncertainty in your estimate. And um, on the next slide, the distribution approach, it really allows you to consider the health risk at all exposure levels and then can place the onus on risk managers to decide what an acceptable level of risk is because the variety of non-cancer health effects that we have is uh, really there's a great range in terms of the severity of those outcomes. So it allows reference values, the reference doses and reference concentrations to be redefined as risk specific doses, where again, the risk manager is choosing that acceptable level of risk. And this is pretty cool for several reasons. Um, first, it is consistent with how we do risk assessment for carcinogenic agents. It still lets risk managers choose a cutoff value. We just have a better, we just end up with a better idea of what the health risk is at, above, and below that value. And it also lets risk managers do important things like explore cost benefit analyses for the non cancer health effects, which are so often missing from those analyses. <clears throat> so I think that's all I have to say about that approach. Um, on the next slide, I'll dive into um, another probabilistic risk assessment approach, which is the clinical vulnerability approach. <clears throat> 
Here, we're recognizing that chemicals and other environmental pollutants may interact with background aging and disease processes or other vulnerabilities. And we investigate, we investigate that association statistically by modeling the joint impact of environmental exposures and disease or aging processes on a shared biomarker. <clears throat> this method allows us to quantify additional risk of clinical disease due to environmental exposures, and that direct link between the environmental exposure and clinical disease can be very meaningful in understanding the health costs associated with environmental exposures and potential benefits of prevention. Okay, so on the next slide here, I'm going to illustrate what that actually looks like. So you can imagine that the unfilled distribution here is the distribution of a particular biomarker of the disease in the general population. And that vertical line over on the right represents a specific cut point that a clinician would use to diagnose disease. And if an environmental exposure impacts that same biomarker, the distribution of that biomarker in the population would be shifted to the right, meaning that more people would fall into that disease category. And then if we go ahead one more, um, there have been several meaningful cases that illustrate the importance of this approach to understand the interaction between chemical exposures and disease, including the effects of cadmium on glomerular filtration rate. So by applying a clinical vulnerability approach, a chronic daily dose of one microgram per kilogram per day of cadmium shifted that distribution of glomerular filtration rates downward, resulting in an estimated 25% increase in population risk of chronic kidney disease. And what I really wanna point out about this approach is that it directly incorporates population variability into these statistical analysis. And it has really important uses in the cost benefit analyses for non-cancer causing agents and other toxic agents. And then finally, um, one other approach on this next slide here is that um, we can use animal data or human epidemiological data to model the full dose response curve for chemical exposures. And this often involves extrapolating models into the low dose range and allows us to quantify health risks across those, that full exposure continuum. Um, so here on the next slide, this approach can be particular power, particularly powerful um, and reflect more population variability, or at least as much as reflected in the underlying studies. And one example of this was done by Axelrad and colleagues in 2007, and their analysis combined the results of three separate studies to assess the effects of maternal mercury exposure on child IQ. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, here on the figure on the x-axis, you can see that we have the location of three separate studies um, and then a combined estimate that statistically put all of that information together and found that each part per million increase um, in hair mercury exposure for mothers was associated with a 0.18 reduction in child IQ. So this dose response relationship can be extended into low dose regions and then quantify the effects of mercury exposure on childhood IQ for all levels of exposure. And so the method um, delineated here really captures as much human variability as is present in the underlying populations that participated in those research studies. Okay, so here on the next slide, um, I've just taken you through some of the overviews of the probabilistic approaches that we have to get a better understanding of health risks across a range of environmental exposures. And these approaches have a variety of strengths and limitations, but most notably probabilistic approaches and risk specific reference values do a better job of incorporating evidence-based human variability and can provide risk managers with more tools to support decision-making for pollution prevention and remediation purposes. And I'm gonna pass it over to Gary to go into a case study that we developed based on perchloroethylene exposure and neurocognitive outcomes using these probabilistic approaches. Okay, thank you, Graylin. Hopefully I'm audible. And um, I appreciate that wonderful setup. I mean, that was risk assessment semester packed into about 25 minutes. So um, great um, lead up to this case study. If we can go to the next slide, and, and am I audible, please? Someone just give me a thumbs up. Thumbs up. Great, thanks, Graylin. Um, so, yeah, perchloroethylene is a focus. It was prioritized uh, by US EPA under TSCA's um, updated approach on prioritizing chemicals for detailed risk assessment 
Uh, this risk assessment did focus on the workplace, but also had some bystander assessments of exposure and potential um, risk, risks, risks relative to the EPA, um, you know, kind of the EPA RFC or the reference concentration for perchloroethylene. It wasn't expressed quite that way in the TOSCA evaluation. They did a margin of exposure approach, which is a little bit outside of what uh, Wendy and uh, Graylin just described, but similar to the to an R RFC approach. Uh, so I'll go further into, uh, you know, the goal of, of my talk really is, is, is twofold. One is, you know, we, we hear a lot about cancer risk as a probabilistic one in a million, one in a hundred thousand or five in 10,000, you know, but there's some probability when evaluating a large population that's highly variable and exposed to the same concentration. What's the probability? in that population of someone having an, uh, an excess cancer term, but we don't have a similar concept for non-cancer endpoints. So how can we bridge that gap? How can we unify non-cancer and cancer risk assessment? So to put them on a somewhat even um, discussion point. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. So uh, perchloroethylene is just one of uh, many chemicals that you could take off the shelf and evaluate the reference dose or the reference concentration. You know, these non-cancer kind of threshold-based um, uh, risk derivations that um, federal agencies make um, uh, for evaluating the, the non-cancer potency of a chemical. And so perchloroethylene we chose because again, it has been prioritized under TOSCA. It's um, got a lot of exposure potential still in the workplace and in the consumer uh, world. And, um, you know, it does present with some human effect levels. The RFC actually is based upon a workplace study uh, so that makes it even a little bit more relevant for thinking about clinical implications, the endpoint neurocognitive decline from years of, of being exposed to the chemical at workplace concentrations, um, you know, is, is relevant on a number of uh, fronts for not only workers, but the general public and for different life stages, you know, neurotoxins are certainly high priority um, chemicals. Uh, so it is a volatile chemical, meaning that it evaporates readily into air. Uh, inhalation is the most common route of exposure. Uh, and PCE, uh, as I just said, negatively impacts neurocognitive function, as well as a variety of other target organs. Next slide. Um, and as I just said, it was prioritized. One of the reasons it was prioritized is because it is uh, found uh, across different workplace environments, especially to be in this chronic exposure range where uh, there is a risk issue, uh, potentially unacceptable risk. And that's what the TOSCA risk evaluation was really focusing on, is whether this exposure range of roughly 0.2 to 1.5 ppm that can be found in the workplace um, is unacceptable, um, and you know what? Are, what are the uh, implications of that? And you know we can actually talk about that now through a probabilistic methods that Graylin described and Wendy set us up for. Uh, we could talk about that in terms of like how much extra risk is there for neurocognitive um, uh, effect potentially decline uh, at these kinds of concentration levels. So I'll I'll touch on that very briefly in the few minutes I have. Um, and so if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, I think I basically outlined the goals, but one of the goals is to compare the cancer and the non-cancer risk, recognizing that it is apples and oranges. They are very different endpoints, different severity, of course, uh, but uh, they still we could still now start putting them on a, a similar uh, discussion point in terms of what's the probability of one versus the probability of the other. Are we being sufficiently protective of both when we think about um, you know cancer and non-cancer risk assessment, say for this chemical in the workplace? Um, and of course, we're as we do the case studies, we're always. Uh, doing the iterative approach, evaluating what our assumptions are, the uncertainties, the data gaps, how could this uh, procedure be done better, more, more data informed, uh, make sure that we're you know, using it to its maximum potential to evaluate all the data that's available for this chemical. Uh, but of course, we're not evaluating 
evaluating all endpoints. Um, we are evaluating neurocognitive decline. That is, in fact, the endpoint that EPA's RFC is based upon, the main endpoint that's the driver endpoint for the TSCA risk evaluation. So, you know, we're narrowing it somewhat rather than reproductive endpoints or others, uh, just, just because you have to, in risk assessment, you have to really sometimes really focus in on a certain goal. And, you know, this is a limited case study. All right, uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a tiny snippet of the literature we reviewed and the key data point from Echeverria et al. Uh, 1995, in which they found, um, um, and, they, and there were three exposure groups in this study of uh, dry cleaning workers um, in, different, um, in, in different shops. Um, in different uh, job descriptions. And they've had, they had a low, a moderately exposed and a high cohort. You know, it wasn't a huge study, uh, but they still were able to see significant decline in what they're calling visual re reproduction score. It's a standardized neurocognitive test. You can do it at various ages. You can see a decline with aging on, on this kind of function. It has to do with visual recognition and memory. So it's a nice integrative, um, bringing together several neuro neurological domains uh, for you know, evaluating an integrated function. And they saw a statistical decline of about, um, about 30 to 40% across relatively high exposure levels. They didn't have a control group. They compared, it's cross-sectional epidemiology, low to moderate to high. So we don't have a true control, but nevertheless, this kind of data was used in setting the RFC and it is useful for us to consider probabilistic approaches uh, based upon um, you know, this endpoint. Okay, next, next slide. So I'm, I'm not going to go into detail how EPA, uh, that's more in our manuscript, how EPA used the information in 2012 to set the RFC. Uh, but, um, you know, suffice it to say that when you can uh, develop an, um, a, a no effect level uh, or a low effect level, in this case, of, of 4.3 parts per million in the workplace, uh, that's a time weight average adjustment for, you know, 24-7 type of exposure with a certain percentage decline in this uh, neurocognitive function. You know, there you start having uh, a point of departure, as Wendy was describing, to do either uncertainty, uh, div 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 dividing by uncertainty factors, or in our case, uh, a prob more probabilistic approach where we're using uncertainty distributions rather than just uncertainty factors to characterize Characterize variability and uncertainty. Uh, and so we did a bit of a, if you want to go to the next slide, we can continue, but we did a bit of a shortcut approach to exemplify how quick uh, and relatively how facile it is to, and, and, and one paper, uh, Which Way Choose work from 2018, he evaluated 1,500 different endpoints for 600 different chemicals uh, for uh, using probabilistic approaches. We're just doing one here to exemplify, but Wasteway's paper is excellent from 2018 as well on this topic. And uh, to show that you can use an appro approximate probabilistic approach to relatively quickly show that, um, you know, ra rather than, you know, starting from a, a, a low effect level of about four parts per million, you can show that the risk for a 1%, um, for 1% of the population to have a 5% uh, um, change in that parameter, in the visual recognition memory parameter, for a 5% uh, deficit in that, for in 1% of the population, you'd be at a, at, a, at a dose level of 0.05 ppm. When you factor in uh, how different I am from you, uh, so that kind of variability, when you factor in other, other types of variability in, in, in ex extrapolating from subchronic to chronic or no L's to low L's, you're down uh, to 0.05 parts per million. And if you wanna look at the one in a thousand risk level, that bottom square, uh, that bottom highlighted box, you are, uh, again, for the same 5% um, um, effect level, but now at a 0.1% or one in a thousand risk, you're at 
0.01 ppm. So that's sort of the outcome of this uh, relatively uh, quick uh, uh, shortcut approach. But now if we go to the implications of that on the next slide, what does this all mean? So uh, our one in a thousand risk level for relatively mild neurocognitive impairment in humans, adult humans, um, is uh, a dose of around between 0.04 to 0.01 parts per million. If you use slightly different approaches, you get that range. Um, the EPA RFC is 0.0059 parts per million. So it's right th down there at about one in a thousand. So one may think that, gee, one in a thousand risk for a relatively mild impairment uh, may not be so bad, but is that, you know, that's an open question. You know, what is the risk target, the appropriate risk goal for this kind of a, for an outcome? Um, we also see that um, at that um, RFC, the cancer risk level is 100-fold lower, or 0.01 per 1,000 or 1 in 100,000. So the cancer risk is 100 times less than this non-cancer risk for neurocognitive decline, meaning that you know normally we think of cancer risk as driving uh, a PCE type risk assessment where there's both non-cancer and cancer effects. Normally the cancer effect drives it. Here, we've got a higher risk for a neuro neurocognitive impairment than we do for cancer, but of course cancer is the more serious endpoint. So it, again, as I said before, it's a bit of apples and oranges, but more apples to apples. You know, when you look at the workplace exposures that EPA is estimating, uh, we, we're looking at a risk of roughly 20 to 375 uh, in, per thousand. Uh, so relatively high risk for a mild neurocognitive impairment at these kinds of occupational levels. And EPA, um, I think appropriately, um, in, in its TOSCA evaluation did recommend that um, you know, additional uh, safeguards need to be put in place at these kinds of exposure levels. So um, if we can go forward. So the case study key findings is probabilistic methods can be relatively easily applied to more thoroughly analyze the health risk at different exposure levels, not just one static yes or no, above or below the RFC kind of approach, which is the, the more standard uh, way to evaluate, to do risk characterization. Um, the approximate one in a thousand uh, risk level is predicted um, uh, to occur um, with a 5% reduction in, in, uh, is, is approximately where the EPA RFC is at. So the RFC is, you know, got a good modicum of protection built into it at one in a thousand, but still, I think it's open to debate exactly what risk targets we do want to have for these kinds of endpoints. You know, um, you know, Dale had us back in 2002 and the NRC panel that I was on in 2009, you know, we debated that and have some other suggestions as well, perhaps, uh, more serious uh, endpoints, neurocognitive, for example, or reproductive, you might want to set a more stringent um, or, or a lower risk target that would be acceptable. So it's, again, an, an area of policy debate. And um, this risk for neurological impairment at the current RFD is approximately 100-fold greater than the cancer risk at the same dose level. So uh, it's just good to have that in mind when we're thinking about the level of protection afforded for cancer and non-cancer uh, endpoints. Um, and continue on. Uh, remaining questions. Well, um, this probabilistic expression of risk leaves open the question of whether it's acceptable. Is it the right range for acceptable risk, risk management decision, as I just discussed. Um, and then what's really the clinical impact? You know, a 5% decrement in visual recognition memory um, is something that doesn't have an immediate, you know, a clinician's not going to look at that and say, oh, I know exactly what that means. So we need, as, as, as Grayland showed for the kid, uh, cat, uh, cadmium and kidney uh, case study, we need to have more clinical correlates to these endpoints that are great to evaluate 
populations exposed in a test battery setting uh, in, a, in an epidemiology study, but how do we make these endpoints more clinically relevant so we can see where those cut points are in a population vulnerability distribution and really start getting more, um, and more clinical with our understanding of what this endpoint means. Um, and uh, these analyses rely on data in adult populations that don't consider may potentially more sensitive populations. And so clearly there's more work that, that needs to be done looking at life stages here. So I think I might have gotten through it, but let's just see. Maybe there's a, a few take homes. Yeah, take homes. So uh, again, traditional RFDs and RFC approaches um, they are bright lines, yes, no kinds of answers. They fail to account for population variability and uncertainty, and they are not really great for economic uh, analyses where we're trying to evaluate the risk benefit or the cost benefit of say applying greater uh, exposure controls or safeguards in the workplace relative to the cost of that. Well, what's the health benefit if you don't have a probabilistic, how many uh, um, people are we sparing from an effect? How serious is that effect? How do we monetize that effect? If you don't have this probability, you, don't, you can't really monetize monetize it. So um, setting reference values at risk specific doses, doses where we feel that we have a good understanding of the probability of harm and what the magnitude of that harm is. Uh, you know, I think that is a, a goal that many in the risk assessment community want to see going forward, that the RFD is better defined in terms of how much uh, probability is there for an effect and what's the magnitude of that effect. So it's not just a number hanging out there as a bright line, a yes, no bright line on its own. So I think I'll stop there. Really appreciate the opportunity to share today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those really excellent presentations. Very thought provoking. We're going to hold our questions with the exception of um, using the Q&A function in the, the Zoom feature where you can ask your questions at any time of the speakers and we can answer those in, in just a moment. At this point, I wanna to turn to our third part of our session, uh, which is our Q&A. And I'm gonna bring up our lead discussant and introduce her. She will briefly um, have a quick conversation uh, with Wilma Stubra, and then we'll bring all of our panelists back for your questions. So it's my pleasure to introduce our lead discussant, former University of Michigan colleague, Dr. Shanice Forte, and she will introduce Wilma Stubra in just a second here. Uh, Dr. Forte is an assistant research scientist at the University of California, San Francisco, Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment, and her current research takes an integrative approach to environmental health sciences, environmental policy, and new methodologies in toxicology research and regulatory development. So welcome and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Trish. I appreciate your generous uh, introduction. It's my great pleasure to introduce Wilma Subra. Uh, she has been described as an unstoppable, unstoppable pioneer in environmental chemistry and community advocacy, um, just to set the stage. <laughs> Wilma Subra received her master's degree in microbiology and chemistry from the University of Southwestern Louisiana, now called the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, um, in 1981, Wilma Subra launched the Subra Company after years of working nights to support community organizers in gaining access to rigorous testing of their environments, followed by collaborating with the U.S. EPA. She has worn many hats, including previously serving as the vice chair of the U.S. EPA's National Advisory Council for Environmental Policy and Technology. Today, she serves as the technical director of the Louisiana Environmental Action Network. Wilma. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'll just start off with a couple of questions. Um, so first question, you have been a leader on the forefront of reducing harmful exposures to chemicals. From the community perspective, why is it important that TOSCA implementation focuses on preventing unreasonable risks to community members? So to prevent unreasonable risks to community members and workers as well. 
And it's very difficult to work with workers when they are employed because they're scared of losing their job. So the first thing is the environment, health, wetlands, and natural resource agencies and all of their programs must identify that risk it does exist. And that's awful difficult for them to put onto a sheet of paper. And then what exposure is taking place and has taken place for an extended period of time. So when you were hearing the previous speakers, the question was how long was that exposure going on? And if you'd reduce it, then at a reduced risk, how long will it take to develop various types of cancers or other conditions? That length of exposure is critical. Then second, community members, have to be aware that there's a risk. And usually they don't become aware that there's a risk until they're involved in something, until there's an accident, until there's an event, until somebody puts something in the newspaper as a big headline and they don't even have to read the article. And then they go, what's going on in my community? What am I being exposed to? And then third, the mechanism must be developed and implemented to reduce community members and workers' exposure. And that's when you start getting the industry challenging what you had thought was standards that they were supposed to meet. And that challenge goes on for years and years and years, and the community continues to be exposed. So to reduce those emissions from sources such as industrial facilities that are existing or proposed, And so when you see in the newspaper, XYZ is wanting to put up this immense facility, then people start asking, will I be exposed to more chemicals than are already that are in the air I breathe and the environment in which I live? And then large and small businesses are often sources of contaminants that are released into the air. You go into the business and become exposed. It deletes into the groundwater, and then your drinking water source may be exposed. So there are a whole host of routes of exposure. And water and sewer treatment systems, you walk by a sewer treatment system, it smells bad, but then they're chlorinating the discharge, and then you get that kind of pollution as well. So to identify events at industrial facilities that release large quantities of chemicals and are contaminated to the soil, the sediment, the groundwater, the surface water, the aquatic and terrestrial organisms and vegetation that you may go out and catch a fish and consume it or bring it home to your family to consume it and you are exposing them to additional risks. And in some cases, the health department or the wildlife and fisheries will put up signs saying do not consume well the fishermen go there and somebody goes there with a a gun and they shoot up the sign so you can't read it and so you go and you fish catch a fish and bring it home and you don't know any better and again that's increasing your exposure absolutely absolutely thank you so much uh for that thoughtful response um Next question is, you've spent a career advocating for health protections. What are some of the most important things to be sure that decision makers are aware of? So in the previous speakers, you heard about a chemical and all the data associated with that chemical. But what about the cumulative impacts? You're not being exposed to one chemical at a time and saying, that's the only thing I'm exposed to. I need to focus on that. The Mm -hmm. cumulative impacts, the multiple chemicals from industrial facilities and small businesses and excess of permit limits that contaminate your air, your water, your drinking water, your soil, your sediment, and all those organisms, aquatic and terrestrial and vegetation. Because right next to industrial facilities, there'll be agricultural fields. Sugarcane is grown right up against the industrial facilities in Louisiana, soybeans. Those things are consumed directly by community members. So what else are you being exposed to as a result of just living by one of these industrial facilities? Then there's varying vulnerabilities of community members 
and the lack of ability to deal with the health impacts because they don't have enough money to go to the doctor. So they know they're sick, but they can't have it identified. They can't have the treatment because they lack resources. And then recently, the last week or so, EPA has come out with fence line assessment approach. And to their credit, they've been interacting with the nonprofits and the community members. And they're currently developing a fence line assessment approach, but they're only looking at toxic release inventory data for a facility. And I've served on a number of toxic release inventory committees by EPA. And when TRI came out for the first, second, and third year, it was magic because you could tell the people this is what's coming out to your air before they'd ask the agency and say, oh, it's just steam coming out of that stack. Now we had data and then now we had data to compare year to year to year. So then you could go to them and say, these are the health impacts associated with these chemicals. And this is how much of those chemicals are being released into your environment because you live right up against them. But because they're only including TRI, there's other data available. They're not including like air monitoring that's performed by state and federal agencies. And they're not looking at fence line monitors that may be included in permit conditions. And then there's always these upsets and accidental releases where there's huge quantities over and above the permit limit that's released into the air. And so we are encouraging them to use that kind of data also in addition to the TRI data. And then last week, EPA Office of Chemical Safety released what's called the air toxic screen. And the screening tool is to provide communities, especially EJ communities, for consideration with more current and complete information about the impacts of air toxics on air quality. We have ethylene oxide has become an issue across the United States. And in Louisiana, we have the major ethylene oxide reducing facilities. We have industrial facilities. And in Texas, they have the industrial facilities and sterilizers. And in Chicago and Illinois area, there are the sterilizers. And the white community was able to get their sterilizer shut down. The EJ community was not so successful. So Louisiana has a facility with the greatest air emissions of chloroprene in the United States. It's the Dinka facility in St. John the Baptist Parish. And EPA has monitors at six locations around it. Then DEQ required the company to put six locations around it. And then the inspector general of the EPA just required additional passive monitors all the way around it. They required 18 locations. And I was out there on Sunday to verify that all the locations were there and were actually monitoring. So these are the kind of things that are still going on, not one chemical at a time, looking at all the chemicals that are impacting the health of the communities living specifically around the fence lines. Thank you. Um, it's a lot to digest, right? It's a lot uh, happening. I think you touched on a couple of things as well. Um, so in your first response, you touched on sort of the community not necessarily being aware there is a risk, right? Um, and you also touched on uh, slightly on um, how injured, uh, excuse me, industry has started to sort of challenge some of these standards and things. Um, when you're sort of in an environment already where we're still working to try and get risk assessment correct, um, and there may be communities that are exposed without knowing, and there may be companies releasing and us not necessarily knowing all of the chemicals released, how do we sort of best implement environmental health research or policy to address these concerns? So from the community's perspective, they need to know what, what we know about their exposure. So I usually use handouts. And when I do presentations to the community, I give them the handouts and they take them to their neighbors who weren't able to attend. A lot of them don't have internet access or even if they have it, they're not savvy at using it. So they can't look up what's going on. Then when you look not only at the cumulative 
chemicals out of one source like air. You also have to look at those cumulative impacts from what is allowed by the permit. And what is their air permit allowed? What is their water permit? And then look at what their drinking water has. The drinking water may be a huge source. A large number of people live along the Mississippi River and between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, halfway down, the Mississippi River water that gets industrial discharges is the source of their drinking water. And the process of purifying that water does not remove all those toxins. So suddenly they are exposed to all these chemicals. One chemical that's a pre-emergent herbicide in the Midwest discharges into the river. And part of the Mississippi River water that's used by the greater New Orleans area exceeds the standard during the early spring through the early fall. And then the rest of the year, it doesn't exceed the standard. And I argued to ha have information so communities could decide whether to drink it or not. And they said, but if you average it over the whole year, it falls below. So go away, Wilma. It's okay. It's below the average. And that is another toxic issue is when it's high, you shouldn't be drinking it. When it's low, it's your decision to drink it or not. But you shouldn't be made to drink it just because you're averaging. And then people go to the river and fish. And again, you've got the aquatic terrestrial organisms, the vegetation, and they take it home and eat it. And it gets all their family contaminated. So varying vulnerabilities within community members. And how do you tell someone that's very old, that's very sick, everything I have is contaminated and I can't give you any food today. So you give them the less toxic food because they have to have food to survive. So this comes down to what the communities know and how they make decisions of their own. Absolutely, thank you. Um, you have inspired a new generation to learn about how environmental exposures can affect people's health in their everyday activities, which you've outlined in your previous responses so eloquently. Um, what are your key messages for students and people early in their career listening in today? So I frequently speak at colleges mm -hmm. and I always tell them, look back on your history and what kind of community exposure and community toxic situations did you see or did you hear, but at that time didn't do anything about it. And consider going back and helping those communities in those situations once you finish school. The biggest danger at finishing school is where you go to get a job and what exposure that job is gonna cost you and where you live. I had an oil company that was moving workers from Houston to Lafayette, Louisiana. They called me and said, I want you to approve every location where our workers are gonna purchase or rent a home because you know where all the waste are, you know where all the sites are, you know where all the contamination is. And you need to be able to advise them whether or not a house they're looking at is over a contaminated area. And that's what you need to watch for when you go, when you rent an apartment or you decide to buy a house, what might be the toxins associated with that location and then if you participate in recreation, are you on a contaminated site? And then what are you exposed to on your way to work and your workplace? And so that's really, really quit critical. And then whatever type of job you take, save a little time to help community members. Once you get the reputation for helping community members, your phone will never stop ringing or your internet will never stop sending you messages. Help them understand what chemicals are associated, what health impacts, and then they will do a lot of the work. But you need to be there available to give them advice. I love that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your insights. At this time, we're going to go ahead and bring in all of our speakers into the conversation. We have Regina Strong, Wendy Heiger Bernays, Graylin Nielsen, and Gary Ginsburg. Additionally, Trish Komen. Hi, everyone. 
Thank you for your important uh, talks earlier and for your time and engagement in being here. Uh, just to sort of start off the Q&A session, we'll be taking some questions that were submitted by the audience prior. Some of these risk assessment assumptions and techniques are complex or hard to follow. Why should the public or health professionals make the effort to better understand them? What would advance the conversation? I'll start. Okay. As you heard, Wilma, right? We should make an effort to better understand stand them uh, because knowledge is power, right? We expected and cited the science during the COVID pandemic, right? We learned, we got up to speed and people could speak the language and respond to those who were perhaps not, um, you know, um, saying what was what we knew to be true. So we need to make sure that the assumptions and the techniques are distilled into pieces that different groups can respond to and different groups will have different messages, but each one is a part of the puzzle. Yeah, let, let me also add, if I may, that um, while we talk about different assumptions and different techniques, we are uh, trying to use a yardstick that's consistent as, as consistent as possible across different scenarios, uh, media, uh, populations, so that uh, you know we can say that the risk here is greater or less than the risk over there, and that can really inform policy in a consistent way. And uh, so if we are building that kind of a, of a model, and we hope we have over the past um, 25 or so, 35 or so years since the Red Book, um, that, you know, uh, it's important for all the stakeholders to understand what is this technique, what is this yardstick that we're using, um, and where are the places where there's uh, expert judgment, where are the places where there is uncertainty, where are the places where we try to factor in variability so we, you understand, we all understand uh, who we're accounting for and who we're not accounting for, uh, and what are the limits to the knowledge base and the data gaps. So um, I, I think it's critical um, that we don't talk about risk numbers or risk assessment in abstract, but we talk about it as informed as possible uh, across the community uh, involved in these decisions. And I would just add to that, I think Wilma said it best earlier that, you know, communities should know what they're facing. And so to really facilitate meaningful engagement, you have to understand the playing field. And oftentimes, it is a challenge for community members who are living their lives in the most impacted communities to seek out this information. So to really facilitate their participation and pull them into the process is critical. It is really how people become informed about the conditions. You know, we sometimes I think take for granted that everyone's lives might be like ours. Everyone's life is not like ours. We are all living in different situations. And if you are in the most impacted communities, you're worried about taking care of your kids, living your life, trying to stay safe, trying to, and all of this in the midst of a pandemic. And oh, by the way, you live next to a facility. So that information needs to come to you proactively, not you have to seek it out, dig it out, and then try to interpret it. You know, as, as I sat and listened to the presentations, I thought, this is all great information. But how do you distill it in a way that people in communities can understand its impact? I say impact all the time because that's so incredibly critical. What could be the potential impact and risk to them given where they live, what they're experiencing? And I think that is really, really critical. Um, and, and, you know, I think from the government standpoint, that is a work in progress, right? That is figuring out how to not make it because you've got... You know, one of the things when I was on the outside as an advocate, I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, why aren't these things happening? And what I've learned since I've been in government is there are a lot of smart people who sometimes don't know how to translate. Like they don't know how to bring that out. So I think you need to figure out from the standpoint of all the information. And that's why it kind of takes all of us working together, how to get things to communities in ways, not just throw it on a website. They may not have that internet access, but really proactively put it out there and work with communities to understand what they face. 
Well, and I think just one thing too, adding in on that, um, you know, one major way that uh, we kind of discount what communities are experiencing is by not capturing non-cancer health effects. Like that, that is a, a whole slew of health problems that people are experiencing every day in their lives that are not accounted for in how we do our risk assessments currently. And so I think just recognizing that it's not just cancer that matters if from chemical exposures is really important. All right, uh, sounds like we're good on that question. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, bring up another question. Uh, the EPA is revising a number of its first 10 risk evaluations to include a single aggregated evaluation rather than dividing up each condition of use of a chemical separately in the evaluation. Um, I think, uh, I think Gary touched on this some in his presentation as well. Um, how can we all support the EPA in this change? Could you repeat sorry, the question I, again? I'm yeah, no, and, and I, I just have to say, I, I have to admit a little bit of ignorance. I'm not sure exactly what the aggregate approach is trying to accomplish or how they're planning to do it. So I need a little bit more background on, on that, but I can do a quick search. So yeah. I can jump in on this one um, to help you there, Dr. Ginsburg. So currently on the first 10 chemicals, a number of the ways that EPA primarily under the previous administration, had looked at the information was focusing on a condition of use. The condition mm -hmm. of use is a term that comes out of the law. So instead of adding up, as Wilma mentioned, that people breathe um, in a chemical, may have dermal exposures, uh, may have it in their waterway um, and, and uh, ingest it um, through water or food, EPA was looking at separate conditions of use and then making risk determinations on a condition of use rather than looking at the whole chemical. And so when we try to explain this to the public that EPA is chopping it up in this way, instead of thinking about it from the way your body might perceive it, um, th there can be challenges in trying to explain to communities what's going on here or why that was selected um, and why we're not looking at, for example, the entire chemical and all of its conditions of use and, and all of the ways in which a person might be vulnerable. So you might be a worker, you might have consumer products, um, et cetera. And so different pathways and different conditions of use may um, add up. Uh, and so currently EPA's approach does not include those things. And they've made a statement in June saying that they were gonna make some changes on that. Yeah, well, let, let me start out by saying that there's value doing both ways, and both ways are important because the risk question may be, well, if someone puts on a respirator, does that solve the problem? Versus, and uh, you know, how much of the risk is that pathway versus some other pathway? So the more you know, you can define it and narrow it down, great. But then, are you evaluating the quote-unquote aggregate risk? Uh, from all pathways or that can occur at the same time in the same individual or you know within the same time frame um, is, is also critically important to look at you know what's that total exposure dose uh, relative to you know a, a toxicology epidemiology endpoints where there was a, a totality of exposure in those studies that was captured so that you can really compare apples to apples. So yeah, I fully agree that EPA's aggregate uh, approach would be appropriate from the sound of it. And in terms of our ability to help them, it's you know, uh, um, you know, quality reviews as well as informing their process with any data that we may be aware of on these pathways, whether it's behavioral information, uh, whether it's uh, air. Or, or media concentrations that they're not aware of or, or that they're not waiting properly. It's whether or not they need to be doing systematic review for any of this. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's those kinds of evaluations that the community, you know, could hold the agency to, to you know, the appropriate standard for. Great, there's a related question. I don't know, Shanice, if you wanted to um, take that right now. It's in the Q&A um, from Donna uh, Zankowski, uh, who is one of our uh, uh, great um, 
uh, partners from AAOHN. She asks, can you discuss the various schools of thought around acceptable risk in the work environment versus for the general population? And Wendy, if you're trying to speak, you might need to. Um... Uh, I'm actually just thinking, I'm actually thinking of this concept of acceptable risk anyway, right? Because um, that's the elephant in the room, which is what is the acceptable risk? I'm not taking away, but I'm the person who put NIOSH instead of OSHA. So I'm not the right person to speak about occupational and occupational exposure. So step back here, turn it over to others. Yeah, the, the concept of acceptable risk is really um, a policy call. Um, and I think that labor unions and leaders in, in different stakeholder environments, you know, really need to be aware of the premise for how standards are set, you know, risk-based standards are set and what the acceptable acceptability of those, um, you know, whether it's one in a million, one in a hundred thousand, one in 10,000 risk, you know, we, we've seen different standards applied to different um, scenarios and, and uh, whether it's uh, super fund or occupational health. And, um, you know, it's, it's always worth questioning, uh, you know, just what's the basis for uh, a certain approach versus another approach. Sometimes it's population-based. You know, if it's not that many people, perhaps it's a different standard than if it's a bigger population. But all, all of that, you know, is really subject to, um, you know, to Q&A on um, uh, just how do we formulate our policy on acceptable risk? Um, again, uh, as a risk assessor, uh, we we try to, and I think the three of us here on this panel, you know, we we try to uh, separate risk assessment from the risk management side, which we could provide the risk, whatever whatever that number is, it's sort of uh, separate from all the um, other management decision making policy decision. Here, risk manager. Here, policy maker. Here's what the risks are. What's going to uh, you know be uh, manageable? How are you going to manage those risks in any given scenario? So there, it's a healthy separation actually to keep risk assessment somewhat separate, and I'll, I call it cure of the risk man, the back end kind of decision making that you know we don't want to bleed into the the front end. Okay. There's another question here from an anonymous attendee that says, is there continued research on pharmaceuticals in our environment and proposed MCLs uh, for them or water quality standards to address impacts to aquatics and terrestrials? Um, I've not seen any research on this form EPA for around a decade when EPA previously led the way until Christian Dotton retired. Well, you know, ph ph pharmaceuticals uh, have been part of uh, EPA's candidate contaminant list and UCMR testing programs, you know, not all pharmaceuticals, but, you know, certain indicator ones um, and um, certainly are on the radar for, you know, being potential MCLs even, or uh, at least to be uh, within the testing regime uh, that EPA puts out there for, for water supplies. So uh, pharmaceuticals obviously made a lot of news back, as you say, about a decade ago uh, when they started turning up in surface water bodies downstream of outfalls of, of various kinds. And, um, you know, some in some cases, there were some public supplies along those uh, water bodies. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, there there's always been a lot of questions over exactly what does that mean uh, in terms of the levels found, cumulative effects, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's still a very important and active area of research. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I think that uh, the, the, the list of emerging contaminants continues to grow. Okay. 
So, so I would add, I will add to that, that that is an area, there's just a recent paper uh, that just came out on the concentrations of a variety of pharmaceuticals. And I do think that, you know, in the past, the data were, there was, there were more data collected around 10 years ago, and then there was a significant gap. And what we're seeing now is that the levels in a variety of surface water bodies um, may, um, you know, if, if there were a real effort to go ahead and look and see what the concentrations are, we in some water bodies, we may actually find levels that, that are very concerning. Um, we do know that um, USGS is the organization that's doing most of the monitoring. Uh, they had stopped for a while, I believe, because of, of funding. EPA does regulate or limits pharmaceutical discharge from manufacturing facilities. So there are data. We've actually tried to access those data, but, but we are having challenges um, getting those data um, for uh, communities that are uh, living on a on a river, um, and for which that river is a water supply. So it is an area of, um, I would say, ongoing research. The fact that it is in this in the um, um, you know in some of the the EPA lists for monitoring and for um, potential assessment will not make them uh, get to the point where there is a, even a discussion of an MCL. Um, so I, I think there are so many other things that are um, probably, you know, even within the, the more direct realm of TSCA uh, that need to be addressed. But it's an, it is an area of active research. This is all good to know. I'm just gonna uh, go down some of the audience questions. So Monica Roy uh, writes, thanks for these presentations on probabilistic risk assessment methods, really interesting. As we've heard from Wilma, so many people can be exposed to chemicals over the identified threshold level and may have health effects from combinations of chemical exposures. In the spirit of Dr. Komen's story at the beginning of the workshop, should more efforts be put towards reducing hazardous chemicals in the first place? It seems like reducing hazardous chemicals and using safer alternatives may have a more powerful effect on reducing risk, more so than reducing exposures, especially for communities that are already disproportionately impacted by chemical exposures. So the question is, um, let me go back. In the spirit of Dr. Coleman's story at the beginning of the workshop, should more efforts be put towards reducing hazardous chemicals in the first place? Oh, it, absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, the, closing the barn door after this has already happened, um, you know, we do it and we keep doing it. We've done it and we keep doing it. Uh, and, you know, there are efforts, there are alternatives assessment, there are, you know, pre, you know, there are screening techniques, um, you know, but they're not, they're not, requ they're, they're required for some screening, but they are not a state, certainly the state of the practice. Um, and yeah, we need to we need to know what's coming out there before it's manufactured. Well, I, I'll I'll say that uh, from my experience with Tosca and seeing it go through changes over time, uh, especially you know 2016 onward, but uh, even slightly before that. Uh, you know, there was an increasing uh, approach at EPA to put, bring in predictive methods where there's data gaps to try to screen out um, chemicals from getting broad um, uh, acceptance in, the, in, in manufacturing, um, uh, you know, and a, a lot, I think, of the problem stems from the early, early days of Tosca back in 1978, circa, where a lot of things were grandfathered in that happened to be in commerce at the time, and there was really minimal testing of these things. And so the, the, the big, the, I think, the, I personally think the biggest challenge to Tosca has been the look back 
on on what has been grandfathered in and trying to do enough predictive toxicology to do enough um, uh, evaluations of what we're already dealing with. I think that you know there's been a lot of focus on on new agents and um, and some of the you know, new abilities to screen them. Um, but um, obviously there's there's been a big gap on uh, catch on the catch up side. So I, I will just quickly add to that, that yes is the absolute answer. Um, getting there is the challenge, right? I like to talk about so many of the things we face now are the ghosts of our industrial past. They are the things that worked at one time and now why find something new? And so that, that looking at impact and how things actually happen in the real world is part of that. And I know there's a lot of science behind it and I know there's a lot, but the real deal is, I think it is imperative that we do figure out how to do that. Um, Cause it's not the what, it's the how. How we get to a place in a space where that is the norm and not the catch up. That is the challenge. And I think that is why all the great minds that are here today and others need to keep talking about how we get there because that whoever asked that question, you're spot on. Um, I don't have a cool analogy for it, but I will say that that's exactly what we should be doing. And I guess too, just to say, I still think at this point we need both. We need both identifying green or safer alternatives to the chemicals that we use. And we also need to be marching back through those chemicals that are in commerce, identifying the ones that are most harmful and you know the associated risks with those so that they could be appropriately cleaned up and managed from a risk standpoint. Fantastic. Um, when we're thinking of these things, where could states make headway in federal policy gaps? I'm not, I wish I had more clarification to that question. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, more so in looking at TSCA implementation and chemical policies, um, basically uh, what is the sort of role that states can play where federal policy has um, not necessarily met the mark? Well, Proposition 65 in California, right, is, is one um, that, you know, uh, attempts to list the uh, reproductive, developmental, and um, carcinogens. Um, there are a couple of other states that are, you know, um, taking, um, you know, I'll, I'll say moving beyond, uh, in many cases, what EPA has done or, or not done. It's a handful of states. Um, I think we're all thinking about PFAS and sort of the, how is that going? Um, because that's where the effort is. And, and one thing I do worry about the, you know, with PFAS, we have opportunities for significant regulation, but we don't want to forget those historical chemicals, right? That are the, the first 20 that are now listed, you know, on TSCA that, that we've been talking about. And, um, Sorry, that's not answering your question. Prop 65 is, I think, the, the most sort of comprehensive. Um, in Massachusetts, we have the Toxics Use Reduction Institute, uh, which is a really phenomenal um, organization. It is um, the Toxics Use Reduction Act required re requires that um, chemicals that are evaluated and determined or substances determined to be high hazard, for example, have to go through a process. And uh, that process is for industries to report the, the, what they're using, the quantities that they're using, uh, and the, um, the basis for that listing includes occupational health and safety. Um, and so the that oh my gosh the Houston, it's, the Toxics Use Reduction Institute the 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 TURI really is a I'll call it preventive 
right? But it is also based on what's already out there and the rationale for listing chemicals on Turi. Um, but it uh, it's um, you know now been able to list PFAS uh, so that industries that are using industries that are um, manufacturing uh, need to report quantities. Um, and this is the same with many of the other hazardous chemicals that have already undergone risk assessments, for example, through EPA. So um, that's another, another way to approach it. I will add that, um, of course, states, they can play a key role because EPA can work directly with states as regulatory partners. And so they can have meetings with states. Um, one of the, the um, commenters was talking about in, in Michigan, St. Louis, Michigan has a Superfund site, et cetera. Um, people can offer up data, examples, um, information, studies. Likewise, as we are trying to, to take more of an environmental justice approach, um, a lot of these issues are longstanding and the states can bring this information forward to the agency as they uh, go through their risk evaluation process. So the states can play a key role in terms of working in partnership with EPA to bring forward data, health protective measures, and uh, the perspective uh, from the communities. And I'll just quickly add that states have been in the business of evaluating um, chemicals um, in, 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 uh, for sale or in products in, in, the, in their jurisdiction and have been either banning or setting limits um, for some of these. Uh, you know, one in four dioxane in products that comes to mind. Some, some states have acted on uh, bisphenol A in infant formula cans. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the, I think the earliest action on um, phthalates uh, and flame retardants were at state levels and then spread to uh, federal and international um, um, restrictions. So um, states have created ripple effects uh, in important areas where they can perhaps do a little bit more, um, you know, safeguarding their borders um, and trying to, you know, protect, you know, evaluate and protect, you know, the, you know their, their constituents. Uh, and then that can spread. Uh, there have been some consortiums of various states that have joined together uh, in clearinghouses on um, chemicals uh, in the marketplace, what's in which products. And, you know, so um, states are actively participating on TOSCA related chemical management policy. Um, it's it's uh, not always headline news, but, you know, it's an ongoing process. So in assessing these chemicals, do you think um, it's possible to sort of bundle chemicals together in assessments? Well, we did it with PCBs. Um, you know, there's 209 congeners that were lumped together as an uh, one aerochlor or another. Um, you know, the question is always coming up with PFAS and there are some fairly natural cut points there um, that are starting to emerge as these emerging contaminants are better known. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm reluctant to do that whole hog. Uh, you know, we wanna be science-based, driven as much by empirical data, you know, evidence-based, so to speak, uh, as possible. Uh, but yeah, where we can either do read across methods like we've done with the dioxide, um, you know, the, the more we can rely on structure activity and, um, and related toxicology information, um, you know, the better. Um, sometimes populations are exposed to mixtures and we know that the mixture of uh, what's in a particulate in urban air is, you know, uh, can, can be, you know, pretty irritating, asthmogenic, uh, you know, inflamed macrophages and, what, and whatnot. So, you know, sometimes mixture studies of, from environmental media can be very telling. Um, and bundling, you know, uh, polycyclic hydrocarbons, for example, that all show up on the same particle. So um, th there's different applications to that concept. Uh, but again, going whole hog without being careful, you got the science behind you, uh, would, would be risky. Absolutely. Gary, is it, is it risky because you'll end up in, the, in, a, in a lawsuit? 
<laughs> I'd rather not, uh, you know, go Sorry. go there. But um, no, it doesn't have to be, you know, from a, from from that kind of uh, perspective. But just going out on a limb um, that you know you you think for for example with the PFAS chemicals, we've got six carbon sulfonate and a six carbon acid, and uh, the two are very different in terms of half-life and 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 uh, tox tox values um so uh you, you can't you know you got to do the you got to do the time to to figure out the you know what, what you've got and uh um you can't just m jump to conclusions unless you know you're data poor and you really need to make a policy decision right now and you know in the in the face in the Faced with uh, da uh, critical data gaps, you know, then then sometimes you do have to do that lumping approach um, and you try to backfill with information afterwards. Fantastic. Um, I do see some context, uh, some questions too, as follow up, specifically um, strategies for bundling PFAS or uh, NIOSH hazardous drugs. I'm sorry, what was the last part of that? NIOSH what? Hazardous drugs, which I, I don't think per se pharmaceuticals is covered by Tosca, correct? No. So it might not. Um, I, I don't know, perhaps NIOSH hazardous chemicals instead. Um, this was from the audience. Sorry. Yeah, no, certainly I'll just comment on the PFAS part that certainly that is a clear objective um, is to try to understand uh, the best bundling or uh, we'll call it class approaches for PFAS. I, I know that in Europe, there's been an approach to bundle, I think 11 or 12 in certain um, EU countries, um, you know, with a certain cap. Uh, and so, you know, we're 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 aware of those approaches and the strengths and limitations, but um, certainly more more needs to be done in that area. And we're always looking for EPA's leadership on that because you know that um, you know they, they they've got a lot of uh, resources to to do that kind of combined testing in advanced high throughput you know scenarios and you know just just look for those kinds of uh, interactions um, you know and and, uh, and 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 give us some basis to, to start making those extrapolations. Um, and then there's also a question from Swathi um, that says, can the panelists discuss in more depth why EPA seems so tied to these outdated bright line methods and isn't adopting probabilistic methods if there's so much more sensitive slash protect protective? How as experts can we best push for that? No, that's that's a great question. Uh, I'll let Wendy, Graham, you you, you want to give your your two cents on that, or or uh, Wilma. Well, I think I, I'm I'm just gonna um, put out there that I think that one of the reasons that EPA and and others are resistant a is because it's seemingly taking an enormous amount of time to do a probabilistic analysis. The uh, resources available for people to actually do that has been given as a reason for why that can't happen. And when one conducts a risk assessment and, face, and the risk manager is faced with the output of a probabilistic analysis, it's harder to make a decision. So I think that those are very practical reasons. Um, I, I, I don't have any a priori knowledge that this is you know, never going to happen. I think we have to encourage. I think we have to show time. You know, we have to keep doing it. Not with one case study. There have been multiple case studies. Um, and you know, particulate matter, there have been multiple, multiple studies in uh, cases out there. I think we have to start talking about it. And I I think, you know, um, we have to um we have to encourage. Um, and I think it has to, I don't, I don't have a reason. I, I, 
I don't think there is a, we're not going to do that. I think it is, um, you know, there are lots of, of new brains, new people at EPA, and I'm, I'm hoping that with those uh, new people, um, that there's a, an ability and a desire and, a, and from, from the top can also come encouragement to, to take this on. I think the scientific community has to push for it. I think if uh, you know the the impacted communities with whom you know we have worked, you know who want to be represented need to be represented in these risk assessments, and that's part of that vulnerability piece, right? Um, it the voices have to be heard from multiple multiple factions. All right, I'm done. And then the the question is that what what sources. Are all the sources identified yet or not? Um, I don't think all the sources are likely identified. Wilma, you know the data, right? But even if we were to do the sources that are identified, I think we would still have a more robust assessment to answer some, some really important questions. One of our um, commenters uh, from the audience uh, expressed that EPA's Office of Pesticide Programs uses probabilistic risk assessment routinely for pesticides. Yes, yes, yes oh, they you. do. And they have multiple, you know, uh, various models that are used to predict exposures over the course of an individual's lifetime on a daily exposure. There are three models that get, get used. Um, and, you know, those, those analyses are, are available. Um, uh, and that is, that's in FIFRA. So EPA has the, you know, has the knowledge, has the, the capability to do that. Um, how, you know, how do you adopt those methods into the chemical, not a chemical sphere um, that come out of the pesticide, which are also chemicals, but how do you bring that over? Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I don't want to lose sight of the fact that it, within the Lautenberg Act, um, there's language that tells EPA to bring in um, addi additional things that will make a risk assessment maybe more complex, but more comprehensive. For example, things like um, systematic review and high throughput uh, advanced tech toxicology predictive tools. So there's a lot going on in the risk assessment world, and, and a lot of it converges on EPA as you know the expectation that they're going to you know um, you know drive the engine or drive the bus here, and uh, all the best newest techniques are going to be used. And um, it's a lot to try to incorporate at one time. Um, and so bringing in probabilistic methods as another piece, um, which may be seen by some as, you know, just adding more complexity and um, more information, uh, not always necessarily showing more sensitivity, but certainly shedding more light on the implications of, a, say, a, a, an RFD or a certain exposure. Certainly, you know, it's, it's, it's information added. Um, but uh, the value of information compared to the value of information you get from a systematic review or the value of information you get from trying to interpret a battery of high throughput predictive toxicology, there, I think that's kind of where the, the battleground is right now in, in, in trying to get these advanced methods to be routinely used. That's great. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and swap things over to Trish. Is there any last questions or comments? Yeah, I wanted to give our panelists an opportunity to make a final closing statement so that they can um, quickly uh, say what some of the key take home messages uh, from them might be. Uh, so if we could do that, that would be um, great. Wilma, would you like to begin? Sure. So considering risk, you have to consider what you're exposed to. So set a time limit when you're gonna gather as much information about what you individually are exposed to and then any community that you may work with what they are being exposed to. Great, Wendy. Oh, sure, let's see. Um, I'm gonna focus this on the TOSCA risk assessments. And I think TOSCA risk assessments have the potential to serve as models to improve the way we do risk assessments and can achieve the goal of the Lautenberg Amendment that has at its core protection of the public's health. 
Great. Graylin. I just wanted to say that I think it's important to elevate um, non-cancer health effects as something that we consider regularly with as much rigor as we do cancer health effects. Gary, how about you? Yeah, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that risk assessment has been built on lots of precautionary health protective assumptions over the years. We've seen some cases where we can improve upon that and get rid of defaults and um, do a better job even of knowing just how protective or, or not that we are. And we have to keep pushing uh, the limits on that so that you know we're as transparent and informed as possible uh, that when people are starting to make policy and de deciding what's an acceptable risk, uh, because that decision on what's an acceptable risk should be informed by how much uncertainty is in that risk assessment. Excellent, Regina. So I would just say in all of this, keeping in mind how people are impacted, how they have been impacted and what communities you're really looking at. I think the key to any assessment is understanding the factors that go into not only um, the health risks, but who's impacted by those. I think it's really about people to the point Wendy made about protecting public health. How do you do that if you haven't identified who the public is? And so I think it's critical to know who you're dealing with in each situation and for each community and what they're impacted by. So, you know, I would say my key takeaway is that we have to make sure that justice is at the core. And I know justice is such a difficult concept sometimes for people who think, you know, maybe differently than I do as an advocate. But I think it, it really is about understanding what people face. So if you equate those two and think about impact, it really, really makes a difference for communities and can help us um, in the government realm and the regulatory realm do a better job um, because we're thinking not just about, like you said many times here, the existing set of chemicals, but also what's coming next. And when we do that, we need to look at how it impacts communities. Wonderful, thank you so much. This was just a really outstanding set of presentations, very thought provoking. And thank you all so much for participating. I wanna thank our partner organizations and I want to invite participants to visit our MLEAD website, which is listed there at the top of the screen to learn more and to sign up to receive uh, continuing educational units if applicable. In closing, we want to uh, be sure that the routine implementation of our environmental laws results in a healthy population. And by learning more and getting involved in TSCA implementation, you can help make a, di a difference and make that happen. So thank you so much for participating today. Thank you to our speakers and best wishes.